It is November the 12th, 2011, and you're listening to Over and Out. Hello everybody and welcome to Over and Out. I'm Stephen Radford. This is a brand new podcast which is an extension to Podfling Radio. In this first podcast, we're going to be talking to Matthew Fittis. Now, I knew Matthew Fittis back in 1997 through about 1998. I think we were both from the performing arts. This was when we were treading the boards for Pajama Game, various other things that uh, I I dare not mention. It was great to catch up with him. We actually talked on the 2nd of November. That was just 10 days ago, in fact, um, which turned out to be the anniversary of A Nightmare on Elm Street being released in the US. Before I spoke to Matt, I had only seen the first Nightmare on Elm Street film. Um, But since then, I've managed to sit through all seven of them and also the, uh, the, the remake. So I've completely submerged myself in Freddy Krueger in the last week. And I've got to say, I'm a little bit more impressed by it. I I have to be honest, I really wasn't sure about Freddy Krueger as a character. I think the the main difference with horror film, with, with, with The Nightmare on Elm Street, for, from my understanding, is that um, it's not supposed to be hiding behind a door slash horror. Um, it's supposed to be a psychological stalking kind of experience. I kind of think about experiment in terror or the evil character is a little bit more obvious. You know, the Cape Fear type of character where he's there, he's visible, you see him in the first reel of the film and you know he's there, but it's 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 not about the when is he going to appear, it's about how... Um, how the kids intend to to get away from him in these nightmares, so yeah, it's it's a different style. It, it's not supposed to be classed in the same box as you will. For um, I mean, we all like to be scared and shocked, but not every horror is supposed to be like that. So sit back and enjoy this little frank discussion about a nightmare on Elm Street, dream demons, and Robert Englund. We're here to talk about uh, the Freddy Krueger films, the Nightmare and Elm Street yeah. series, and um, and yeah. But first of all, tell us who you are and where you actually are from, where you're actually hailing from right now. Okay, I'm I'm Matthew. I'm 34 years of age. I originally come from Boston. Yes. I've uh, been there for uh, 21 years, and then moved from there to Northampton, which um, which well, I've been living there for the past 14 years. Uh, married with a teenage stepson and a teenage daughter. Great. Sounds like uh, a, a busy little household you got going down there. That and the hamster as well. And the hamster as well, but... Uh... Well, it's, well, it's, well, the hamster's not mine, it's my daughter's, but... Well. <laughs> so tell us about your uh, your first experience of of watching A Nightmare on Elm Street. Now, it, it, this actual interview that we're conducting now is actually on an anniversary, isn't that right? Yes. Yes, it is. It's the 27th anniversary of the original film's release in the U.S., um, okay. 2nd of November 1984. Um, it played, I can't remember how many screens it originally played mm-hmm. at the time, but I remember one time it was posting that 55% of the market played. It had, it had taken well over $14.5 million, which uh, is pretty good going considering that the budget of the film was $1.2 million. Very smart. And... And the hard time that Robert Shea of New Line Cinema got to uh, getting the money together to make the film, which we'll go into at some point in this uh, in this interview, um, that in itself, if you pardon the pun, was a nightmare. But um, I'll say more on that later. But let's say for, um, for 1984, I mean, it's been a pretty low budget film. To uh, raise that amount of money and in that short amount of time was pretty good going, and the film actually went on to make over twenty-six million dollars at the U.S. box office. Um, I don't know how much it took the rest of the world, but that in itself was quite a successful film at the time. Yeah, that's that's a, a, a staggering difference, and I think the horror genre has always been one of those genres where it's either been a hit or a miss. Well, 
to quote what Robert England once said in, 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 in an interview when he was promoting Freddy's Dead over here back in 1992, he said that the horror film itself is treated like um, the poor country cousin to the so-called A movie, you know, like the big blockbusters of today and, and that sort of thing. Yeah. In Europe, in the UK and the rest of the world, it's, it's, it's treated with a massive amount of respect. There are loads of fans out there, not just Freddy or Jason or Michael Myers, but I mean in horror in particular. Yeah. They have a deep respect for it. They can speak, um, you know, talk about horror with such intelligence. And it has it has changed over the over the uh, the decades. And... Oh, it has. It definitely has. I mean, if, if you look at the horror films from the 60s and the 70s, I mean, you had films like Psycho and Rosemary's Baby uh, in the 60s, like really big horror movies of, of that decade. You get into the 70s with films like The Exorcist and The Omen. I mean, The Exorcist in itself was a hugely successful film. I mean, it was, it was big budget at the time, and a lot of the stuff that they actually did in that film, I mean, it, they, they spent months and months and months filming this, you know, filming the adaptation of William Peter Blatty's novel. And, mm -hmm. you know, it, it raked in the big bucks when it was released. Um, just after Christmas of 1973, and if you if you um, inflation adjust the taking, it, I think the amount of money it took was just a little bit less than half the um, amount of money that Titanic took when that was released back in 1997. And then as you go later on into the 70s with films like Halloween, and then you go into the 80s with Friday the 13th, and now with A Nightmare on Elm Street. Um, the horror genre has just changed dramatically. Sometimes for the better, sometimes for the worse. But yeah, I, I, and I think a lot of that has has to do with the way that society treats it. I think to begin with, when when horrors started to get uh, reimagined in in the in was it like uh, end of the nineties, I think, where yeah. they started to try and work more in terms of gritty realism and um, uh, to create a thick darkness. That uh, that and and it, it kind of it became a, a known thing that it had to be this raw grittiness that that everybody kind of like has to has to go into the cinema and actually endure it. Well, it's the best it's the best form of escapism you can get. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing more exhilarating than seeing loads of people sitting in a darkened cinema screening of a horror film and everybody screaming, jumping out of the seats at the same time at something that you, you probably think. Oh, you're going to predict that this is going to come, but when it hits you, it, it you know, it's like you've just walked into a war. You, it's unexpected. My first experience of watching a Nightmare on Elm Street, I was 13 years old. Uh huh. And actually, the, the first film wasn't the first one that I'd watched. At the time, every, I think all, every kid who was under the age of 18 knew who Freddy Krueger was. And, was aware of these films. Yeah. And, you know, they, they probably sat downstairs and watched them if the parents brought them in, you know, brought them in from the video store to watch that night themselves, and they just sort of sneaked and watched a little bit of it and liked it so much that they wanted to watch it. That's right. That's but easy. For me, the very first um, video that I watched to do with Freddy was actually a couple of episodes of the TV series, Freddy's Nightmares. And then after I watched that, um, I went round to a friend's house and they had a copy of the fourth film, The Dream Master, so we sat and watched that. You sort of become hooked. I mean, I definitely was. I mean, um, one of the commemorative magazines that was there at the time, I think it was to do with the fifth film, The Dream Child. Um, I bought a copy of that and, of course, was familiar with the character of Freddy and also what went on in the film. A friend of mine... At the time when Sky Movies had only just started, when satellite TV was becoming the big thing in the sort of like, I think it was like late 80s, I think it was the beginning of 1990 mm -hmm. actually, um, a friend of mine actually recorded A Nightmare on Elm Street for me off of Sky Movies and I brought it home, uh, put it in the video, I was watching it with my mum and dad, and that was it. I absolutely fell in love with it. You know, it, it, it's, it's basically stuck with me for the past past 21 years now. But uh, what, what can you tell me about the uh, the origin of Nightmare on Elm Street? How did Wes Craven uh, come across this this idea of of children 
uh, teenagers uh, dying in their sleep from... Uh, well, it, <laughs> it was all, all from a series of newspaper articles. It was in the Los Angeles Times that Wes Craven um, came across these articles. And there was like a year and a half um, apart from each other. It was like three... Well, the newspaper considered them to be unrelated, but Wes saw these three articles and he knew he thought that there was a connection somewhere. Mm -hmm. And it was all to do with um, young um, Hmong men that, that had been in forced relocation camps. Um, they basically took, um, come out of there and moved to like America or whatever. It, it was basically the time of Pol Pot, the time of Cambodia and the Khmer Rouge and stuff like that. It was all within like the late 70s, the beginning of the early 80s. Uh -huh. And it was the third article that the Los Angeles Times had printed that really hit a nerve with um, with Wes Craven. Um, again, it was a young man who had come out of forced relocation camps with his um, family. Um, his father was a doctor. And the son basically turned around to him and said, look, I'm afraid to fall asleep. I'm afraid there's something after me. And I'm afraid that if I fall asleep, I'll die. I won't wake up at all from this. And they did everything in their power in order mm -hmm. to get this, this kid to sleep, um, giving him warm milk, um, sleeping pills that his father demanded. They take his father as a doctor. Um, he gave him sleeping pills, but the, the, um, the kid didn't take them. He hid them under his pillow. And uh, he had a coffee pot um, percolator um, hidden in his room that he had connected up to a large extension cord, which he'd hidden behind curtains so he wouldn't be seen. And just one evening, while he was sitting up with his parents watching the TV, he fell asleep. Um, mm -hmm. Relieved by this, I thought, oh, he's actually fallen asleep now. They took him up to bed, put him mm -hmm. into bed, put the covers over him, um, went downstairs, watched the rest of the movie. I think they went up to bed after it finished. And all of a sudden, just during the middle of the night, they heard screaming. Um, they rushed into his room, and the kid was just dead. Okay. Um, an, autop an autopsy revealed there was nothing wrong with the uh, with the boy, except that he, he just died in his sleep. And it all seemed to stem from the fact that it, it was probably something that he had actually dreamed about. Wow, and that's incredible. Once, yeah, and once Wes read about this, he thought, I've got to make a movie about this. Hence, the creation of um, A Nightmare on Elm Street and the creation of um, Freddy Krueger. The idea of actually creating this this character, I mean, um, with Freddy Krueger as we see him now, um, do, you, well, do you know if there was a process there, or was it just, that's it, I know what I want, I want this guy with the hat, the glove, stripy top? Well, uh, um, with Freddy, a lot of it was all from Wes Craven's past. I mean, Fred, I mean, in the original film he's called Fred Krueger. Um, it's only from like, the second film onwards that we all know him as Freddy Krueger, even though in the first film you do hear Nancy call him Freddy. Um, but um, Fred was the name of a kid who used to bully Wes Craven quite a bit. He, I think he had the same paper out as him, and he used to bully him quite frequently. Um, Krueger is an extension of one of the characters that Wes Craven came up with for the film Last Hour to the Left. Um, it's an extension of Krug. Um, the main villain from that film. Gotcha. Um, the hat was similar to a hat that he that was worn by um, a drunk who sort of frightened West once when he was a kid. Um, this drunk sensed that someone was watching him and he just turned around and gave him a really um, frightening stare and it just scared him ever since. Um, the jumper. Now, if... Um, not a lot of people will probably know this, but in the film, the jump is red and green, but in the original screenplay, the jumper was actually red and yellow. Uh-huh, right. In the, very first, in the very first draft, which I've actually seen a copy of, um, it was about this guy wearing a red and yellow sweater. But the reason it was changed to it being red and green was that West had read an article in a scientific magazine that the two colours, red and green, were difficult for the human eye to put side by side. So in a sense that made that made it a bit unnerving. Gotcha. And yeah. And the weapon and the weapon of choice, the famous glove, um, 
he was going through all different sorts of weapons. What what would this guy have? Would he have a knife? Would he have a sickle? Would he have like a machete? Well, say machete, you already had that with Jason in Friday the 13th. But um, you remember there was a time he had a cat and he saw the cat just retracting its claws or just doing something with his paw. And that was it. That was how the glove was born. And I mean, you, you just showed um, people just those three items the hat, the jumper, and the glove. Or just one of them, and instantly they would turn around and say Freddy, just like that, because they are such recognisable pieces of his costume. And it's incredible that they're all elements that that were all separate in his mind. They all came at different times, different different inspirations. And yeah, I mean, it, it, that that's how it works. You you pull in all these yeah. different things, and you get something, and it and it is a unique image. I don't think it has ever been uh, recreated. A lot of the with the other characters we've mentioned, like Leatherface. Um, Jason Voorhees and even Michael Myers. Yeah. So they're all played by people that do not say a word in any of the films. They're basically like stuntmen or yeah. just lanky, um, strong, big build people that are going around. Silent killers, medicine. basically. They don't have to say anything. They don't have to. They only have to just turn up and and no. yeah. Stab, stab. But what gives? <laughs> but what gives Freddy such an appeal is the fact that he has. He has a personality. He has a character all of his own, and it's just brought to life brilliantly by Robert Englund. Yeah, and each and every time, it's never been anybody else. It's always been Robert Englund. Isn't that correct? Well, until the remake that came out last year, it, it had always been Robert. But um, he was the one that sort of brought the character to life. He sort of brought him to life off of the page once he read it. He really wanted this role, and. Um, I'll tell you a really good story about this. Um, the casting director of A Nightmare on the Street, Annette Benson, uh-huh. had worked on another film called National Lampoon's Class Reunion. And Robert Englund had actually gone for every single male part that was in that film, but didn't get anything. He got no role at all. Okay. And the casting director... Um, really felt sorry, but I think she sensed that there was something there, because she thought it was weird that he kept coming back for all these different roles, that there was something there that was, that made her think, would he be suitable for a different kind of role? And when she was bringing people in for West to interview for A Nightmare on the Street, she phoned up Robert's agent, um, Joe Wright, and said, look, um, can you get someone down here you know, to um, see Wes for this for this role, and they said, "Well, look, I can get him down to you, sort of like ASAP." And said, "Good, get him down here now," and that was it. See, a, a, the rest is history, basically. A, a lot of films are actually rescued by good casting, and I think that uh, mm-hmm. the, the role of a casting director, uh, sorry, a casting agent, is is heavily under underrated, and so they don't realize that. That all these all these actors and all these actresses who get these roles, who become perfect for the roles, they're they're actually brought in by these casting casting people and, yeah, I mean that that sounded like one of those stories that it was, you know, her sheer uh, understanding of what was needed for the role. And yeah. Going after well, him. I mean, the, well, I mean, what they said that the casting of Freddie for the first film was a really big deal. Yeah. I mean. If, if he made the wrong decision, I think the film would just have fallen flat on its face. Having Robert Englund playing Freddy in that film just made it gave the film more strength, and yeah. he played it with such evil. I mean, I think to quote what um, West said, he said that he came in with such piss and vinegar, and he really wanted the role about it. That you know, he he just that. He, I mean, Robert Englund is he's, he's really talkative. I mean, I've met him myself, and he right. he's He's the sort of person that, you know, he takes time out to speak to the fans. You know, he he's really down to earth, and he, he's 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 really with it. Um, I mean, once he starts talking, he's like a locomotive; he just doesn't stop. Um, but on that occasion, he just sat there, listened to what Wes had to say about the role, about the film in general, and that was it. And I think there was something there that Wes saw that thought for himself, "This is the guy for the role." Exactly, and see, so when, when did you actually meet him? How many years ago was that? It was six years ago. We met him at um, Milton Keynes, 
um, is one of these big film and TV collector's pairs they have on. Uh-huh. And um, I wasn't aware of it at the time, but the day that we met him, um, it was actually on his wedding anniversary. Gotcha. It was on the 1st of October 2005. Um, we all went down there. I think I was, I think I'd waited for something like four hours, and I was not disappointed at all. Great. To be a part of something for so long, but yet still still be able to give to the fans after all these years and, and still keep it oh, fresh. Oh, definitely, and definitely. He must, he must get the same questions over and over again, and I bet you he still answers them with the same vigor and, and, and intelligence. Well, he, he, you know? Yeah, I mean, he still has people come up to him dressed as Freddy and signing Victor Freddy memorabilia. I mean, yep. he signed my um, poster that I got for Dream Warriors, yep. the British film poster for Dream Warriors. Just expecting him to put his autograph on it, and he does a little caricature of himself on the poster as well, which I thought was really nice. That's really good. Yeah, because, I mean, well, before he took on the role of Freddy, I mean, he was famous for playing the role of Willie in the science fiction series V oh, right. in the early 80s. And, um, you know, in, I remember um, him saying at one time in his, um, in his book that I've got, um, he said that he was there um, doing signings for V and the Willie character when Robert Shea came up to him and um, started talking about, you know, how successful the film is and everything and that. He was, he was obviously talking about A Nightmare on Elm Street. And he said, well, you should see the queues outside. You know, it, it's really big. And he says, yeah, I'm, I'm sure it is, Bob. I think all these people are here for me. And he says, nah, it's a nightmare. And when he looked, the queue had changed from sort of like these geeky, nerdy type of kids to... Um, kids that were dressed in like black leather all pumped out and everything like that the, the heavy metal yeah. um, rock type of um, people Hey everybody I'm sorry to just interrupt this interview but we have a few words from our sponsors You unlock this door with the click of a mouse Beyond your screen lies another dimension. A dimension of paranormal events, conventions, and investigations. You're moving into a land of interviews, live chats, and prizes. You've just crossed into ReporterChicks.com. Reporter Chicks, bringing all your favorite haunted locations, events, and faces right to your computer. Join the chicks, Charlie, Buffy, Danny, and Sarah Thursday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for the hottest paranormal happenings from coast to coast. Only on ReporterChicks.com. Will Robert Englund be returning for the role, or is that it now? I think um, I think he's closed the door on the series for good. Gotcha. I mean, the, I mean, the franchise has basically been restarted now with the remake that came out last year. You've got a new actor playing Freddy in the form of Jackie Earl Haley, who loads of um, genre fans know as Rorschach from Watchmen. Now, he did a pretty good job of the role, um, and I was quite impressed with how the remake was done. I mean, the, um, I think it was like a couple of years before the film came out, I was saying to friends, I'm not going to see the remake because I know for a fact it's not going to have the same impact as it did then. And then when I heard that someone else was going to play Freddy, I thought, that's it, I'm not going to see it now. But then I saw the two trailers that were out, and I thought, well, it could be quite interesting. Mm -hmm. Put a new spin on it. And then I went to see it at the cinema last year, and I say I, I, was, I was quite impressed with the efforts that they did. Yeah. So... Yeah, and I, I but, think um, when it comes along as a remake, you, you have to step back and say, okay, well, it, it's going to happen regardless of my liking or not liking of it. Uh, yeah, cause, I mean, at least you can do is watch it and see for yourself, and sometimes you're pleasantly surprised. Yeah, you, you look at the classic horror films that have been remade. I mean, Psycho, I've not seen the remake, no intention of seeing the remake. No. Um, of course, you have the Texas Chainsaw Massacre um, that had been remade in 2003, and then they bought out like a prequel story, and then there's a new one that's coming out in 3D next year. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it was only a matter of time that um, until they got their hands on a Nightmare on Elm Street exactly. to do their own version of it. Exactly, because it, it's remake heaven out there at the moment in Hollywood, and I think that they're, they've found a nice safe haven in there, 
uh, to just keep on re regurgitating stuff that's already been successful. Um, I think it's probably because Hollywood's run out of ideas. I think they've run out of ideas, and also I think they're they're tightening their belts. I mean, uh, they're, they're being uh, same with the music industry. They're being hit by so many uh, obstacles, such as piracy and uh, and illegal, illegal copying, that uh, they're they're constantly in fear and only focusing on the money um, and what can actually be a money spinner. Music these days, yeah. I don't think you can get anywhere without actually finding a song that is just designed to make money. Um, so unfortunately, it, that that's how it is, and I think that you can probably find nowadays with people having their own video cameras at home and uh, a lot more independent teams uh, of of amateurs are actually going out there and 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 working some pretty incredible and in, original stuff. So, oh yes, that's true. But as long as they sort of take their influences as what's from out there now, yes, and try and think, try and sort of like create their own version of it without sort of plagiarising what's there already. Exactly. Well, I was going to say about the, um, in, in the terms of um, how, they, um, how they got the money together to make the films. Of I mean, course. at the time, um, New Line Cinema um, were basically a, a distribution company. They were a 16mm distribution company um, based in um, Lower Manhattan, New York, um, long before they moved to Los Angeles and Hollywood. And it was basically run by two people, Robert Shea, mm -hmm. who's like the, the chairman and the founder of the company, and Sarah, um, Sarah Risher, who was the co-producer of the first film. And um, when the script for Nightmare came to him, he was really taken by it, and he really wanted to make this film. The only problem was he didn't have any uh -huh. money at the time to put in to, you know, to put in as part of, you know, for the budget was concerned. Yes. So he had to get money from outside sources. I think he even had to. I think he even borrowed money from friends and family as well. But he was looking for the real major investor, and one of the companies involved with the film, Smartic Pictures, were going to invest a million dollars into the film. They're going to advance him a million dollars to put into the production. So I think like a few days later, after they just turned around and said oh, they, they were going to drop out of it, so Robert was back to square one. And um, Rex remembered one time he said that when he looked at Robert Shea's fingers, his fingernails, he could see that he was really digging into them and they were really bloody. And I think it dawned on him then the extra stress and strain of, of actually getting money together to make a film. Um, but he managed to get it in the end. He uh, made a deal with a major home video um, distribution company in America called Media Home Entertainment. And a guy called Joseph Walt, he was one of the executive, executive producers on A Nightmare on the Street. Uh -huh, yeah. And he said, look, you can take over the whole film if I can't get my commitment together the next three or four weeks. He then managed to go back to the guy who ran Smarty Pictures and, money, and browbeat him into putting forward the last remaining few hundred thousand dollars. Gotcha. And um, got the film made. But he just hated the process of getting that together in order to, you know, get the film made. And it nearly didn't get made. It nearly, it nearly didn't even get shown into the cinemas. Because um, the company, the lab that was processing the negatives at the time to get the films out to the cinema, uh -huh. get the, the actual film reels out to the, the um, film theatres in America to play them, um, they turned around and said, you're not going to have the prints unless we get paid. And again, there he had to. He managed to find a way. Of, he actually made a deal with the lab that was processing the um, the prints in order for the films to be shown onto the screen. And mm -hmm. he did a good job that he did. Or you know, we wouldn't be sitting here now. There wouldn't be loads of people uh, around the world, um, you know, watching these movies, talking about them, um, you know, for the past 27 years. Exactly. So it's a true testament to him getting it out there because he believed in it so much. Um, he believed in West so much in, in, in that story that, mm -hmm. you know, not to have it made or not even to get it on the on the cinema screen would have been a tragedy in itself. Absolutely. And uh, I, I think I've, I myself have kind of, um, from talking to you, kind of a, a newfound respect for the series because I, I, I must admit I, I, I've probably watched it the least out of all the all the uh, horror series, and I, I I don't think I've seen that many of the sequels. 
Um, so it's certainly something that I'm going to uh, pick up and uh, take a look at uh, one by well, one. Surprising. It's surprising the number of people that I've spoken to as well. Um, in fact, one of the people that I work with, he's not even seen one. I mean, as I say, these films have been out there now for, like I say, for the past 27 years. Yeah. Yeah. And it's amazing how many people have not actually sat down and watched one. I mean, they, they've been on the TV, um, goodness knows how many times. They're available to buy in the shops. I mean, the, the first seven films have now finally come out on Blu-ray mm-hmm. in a box set. So, you know, people can now watch them in glorious high definition. So the picture and the sound quality is going to be absolutely fantastic. It needs to come to them in their dreams, maybe. Well, yeah, that's true. <laughs> That's probably why. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, it is one of those movies that, um, because you you always hear about Halloween around Halloween time because Halloween is Halloween. Friday the 13th, yeah. there's, there's uh, several of those uh, every year, Friday the 13th. But, uh, yeah. you know, I, I think Nightmare on Elm Street doesn't actually have its own holiday or a place in the year. Uh, usually Halloween kind of picks it up somewhere and uh, and people, of course, get into the get-up, but... I think well, it's funny you say that. Actually, more in because a twenty, yeah, because twenty years ago, mm-hmm. um, uh, the day before Freddy's Dead: The Final Nightmare was released in the states, mm-hmm. um, it was released on. You got to believe this date here, Friday the thirteenth of September, nineteen ninety-one. Yeah. Um, the day before, it was actually declared Freddy Krueger Day in Los Angeles. Gotcha. Because the whole because like the series was meant to be coming to an end after being around for seven years, um, that they that they they sort of had well it wasn't actually considered like a national holiday, but it was an entire day devoted to this popular character, this now popular horror icon that had been you know around during like the latter half of the 1980s and mm-hmm. the beginning of the next decade, the 1990s. Yeah. Um, of course, like the first five films, um, plus two seasons of the TV series Freddy's Nightmares, before Freddy's Dead came out, um, that they they did like a massive celebration, and uh, again, it just shows how much love and respect the fans have got for these films and for that exactly. character. Exactly, and and I think it. Uh... Uh, whatever happens in the future, you know, they, they will still have that fan following, and at least, you know, the the movies will forever be immortalized on on whatever disc is available to buy them on. So uh, that's at oh, least yeah. the thing. At least it's out there. Um, yeah. It's not going to. I'm I'm just hoping that in a few years' time, um, well, they say in three years' time, because um, in 2014 it's going to be the film's 30th anniversary. They have one really massive celebration. Yes. Have all the films being shown in the cinema on the big well, where they should be on the big screen. That For me, it would be an absolute dream because I would love to see the original film on the big screen and actually, in, you know, sit in the dark room with loads of other people experiencing it. A, a real fan experience, um, yeah, like 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 they did for Star definitely. Wars. Just have a complete marathon. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, to be honest, I mean, I, I think you're in a position now where the, the social networking uh, doors are, are wide open. I think the more people who actually voice that, the the, the, the most likely it's going to happen. So yeah. Let them give in to the social network peer pressure, I say. Yeah, that, that's the only <laughs> way forward now. That's the, that's the way it always goes. So, yeah, I, I, I think in, in three years' time we can always, if we're still doing a, a podcast, whatever we're going to be doing um, – Maybe we can also pick up the uh, the call again and uh, and have oh, our yeah. own celebration through podcast. Yeah, by my, by which time my hair has probably got more grey and I've probably lost a few more brain cells. Yeah, you never know. And I, might, <laughs> I might have, a, I might have a, something screaming in another room, uh, other than my wife. <laughs> Bless her. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for uh, for joining me for this. Uh, for this interview, it's uh, it's that's, light. that's not a problem. Well, thank thank you for inviting me. Uh, and is there uh, before I sign off, is there anywhere that uh, you can uh, you'd like people to go um, to find out more information about yourself or the Freddy uh, franchise? Uh, well, there is one website that I've been on quite a bit. Uh, uh-huh. it, it is a fantastic site, and it's actually run by another one of my friends on Facebook. Her name is uh, Deandra. Um, she's got her own. Um, um, Facebook account as a cos 
player. She goes under the um, moniker of Nancy Thompson of Elm Street. Uh-huh. Um, and I see, you, you see a picture of her, and you think you're actually looking at the actual Nancy from the first film. Gotcha. She's got she's got it she's got it rolled down to an absolute T. Oh. Um, but she she moderates a site which is um, www.nightmareonelmstreetfilms.com, gotcha. and it's a fantastic site. There's loads of pictures from the movies. There's um, stuff like from the press kit. You've got deleted scenes on there, um, behind the scenes photographs, even posters from each of the films from around the world, uh, as well as um, stuff to do with the TV series. Um, the downloads, it's like you can download the trailers or even TV spots, mm-hmm. um, even other like different trailers from America to do with the films as well. It's, it's a fantastic site and really worth actually looking at. Great. Okay, um, that, that sounds like a good uh, yeah. a good link. And one more as well. Um, another friend of mine on Facebook, um, funny enough, was actually in one of the Elm Street movies. Uh, mm-hmm. Leslie Dean, she played Tracy in Freddy's Dead, The Final Nightmare. Um, now, if any of your listeners are uh, massive music fans, uh, let me point you in the direction of Scary Cherry and the Bang Bangs. Okay. Now, I was pointed in their direction by Leslie herself. She's the actual lead singer, and she goes under the uh, pseudonym of uh, Scary Cherry. Well, that's Scary Cherry and the Bang Bangs, right? Scary Cherry and the Bang Bangs, yeah. Um, they've, got an e- they, they've got an EP that you can get on iTunes, gotcha. as well as um, a single on, on there as well. The, the, the single's called Cherry Bomb. And the limited edition EP is just called Scary Cherry and the Bang Bangs. There's five songs on there. And they're all written by people in the band. And it's a, it, it's well worth listening to. She's got a really unique voice. I think I remember posting on Facebook one time that she sounds a little bit like Debbie Harry from Blondie. Nice. Ah, so she, she does have a, a reach back to the those uh, that kind of uh, punk rock yeah was, yeah but a lot of her influences well, the band's influences are people like um Icky pop and alice cooper gotcha, gotcha. Uh, as well as a few other things as well but they have got their own unique sound and it is it is really really good i do recommend it yeah so you heard it guys you've got uh the nightmare on elm street um film website um there'll be links on the website as well for that um, I'm sure you can find Matt Fittis on um, on Facebook. I'm sure I'll be more than happy to uh, to have you follow him. Uh, <laughs> it, unless I follow you. <laughs> unless, unless he follows you first. <laughs> and uh, there, and there is a there is a big community out there for the for the Nightmare on Elm Street films, and I'm sure that uh, Matt also contributes to those as well. And uh, oh, yeah. of course, yep. Yeah, don't forget to check out. Uh, I've forgotten her name already. Cherry and the Bang Bangs. Scary Cherry and the Bang Bangs. And don't forget... You'll find, them on face, they'll find them on Facebook as well. Don't forget to check out Scary Cherry and the Bang Bangs. Um, so there we have it, folks. That's Matt Fittis, and that is A Nightmare on Elm Street. And uh, I hope you all sleep well to this one. Thank you very much Sweet for uh, calling in. <laughs> 